Hi everyone, Blue Goblin here for a very, very late comic book review in which I'm going to review the comics that ended the month of May 2016. Let's see if May went out with a bang. In my opinion, yes it did. Um, was it perfect? Not quite, but it was still a great, a great week and a solid end for the month of May. And let's just hope June can deliver as well. Uh, got some indies and the big two. We're going to start with Broadsword Comics. We're going to start with Tarot, Witch of the Black Rose, number 98. Um, yeah, this was, um, this felt like a, a one and done storyline uh, with uh, Tarot dealing with a foe from her past which was uh, basically you know dealing with like voodoo type of black voodoo style type of black magic she's able to possess dolls and she's like got this enchanted Ouija board that she carries around with her and she just looks uber creepy uh, I'm forgetting the name of the character but yeah so, uh, Meanwhile, Skeleton Man's got his hands full rescuing a corpse, uh, you know, rescuing, you know, a person who's uh, living impaired, as the, the term would be. And, uh, yeah, things don't go so well for him. You know, Crypt Chick is there with him. He ends up taking a knife and a bullet. But how he lives, I'm not going to ruin that. I mean, this was, um, this was very fun. No over gratuitous nudity in this issue, which that's fine. But there was some good storytelling in there for the most part. It was good for what it was. It was fun. I did enjoy it. You know, I, I could, but certainly this is not everybody's cup of tea, and I understand that. I give this a three. All right, we're moving on to IDW. We're going to uh, Back to the Future number eight. Okay, I'll admit, when this series first started, it took me a while to get on board. It, it's getting better. It really is getting better. This is part three of Continuum, Condu uh, Continuum Conundrum, in which we're in 1986. Doc Brown is back, but he doesn't have all of his memories. And in this issue, he is just starting to remember Marty and Jennifer. And also, unfortunately, he's starting to remember his family back in 1885, Clara, Jules, and Vern. Uh, they still have that hyper, you know, uh, you know, car chase with needles. There's all kinds of crazy shits going on in here, and Doc's Doc's in uh, really bad trouble here. He's, you know, trying to figure out how he can, you know, get his life back on track now that his memories are finally starting to come back. And Marty has only one solution: going back in time again a uh, very very good issue very nicely done um, loving the storytelling loving the character interactions you know Marty Doc and Jennifer just have that chemistry about them it just really clicks and I like how they're using Jennifer more as a main character rather than a supporting character she feels a little more important here than she did in the movies let's be perfectly honest with ourselves here they're making her seem more important, and I like that. This was good. A solid issue. Very nicely done. Not perfect, but I did enjoy it. I give it a 3.5. Next up, sticking with IDW with Ghostbusters International number 5. The Ghostbusters go to the Louvre in, in uh, Paris. I knew it was only a matter of time before these guys went to Paris. Man, oh man. This was fantastic. This was really good. Um, it's that that classic, old school, timeless Ghostbusters comedy was there. I mean, if this was an actual TV show, it felt like it felt like a TV show. It, it was that good. You know, the Louvre is is uh, is haunted by the main threat that they're going after in here. They're on this. They're on a mission to retrieve an artifact. Meanwhile, Egon is still over in New York City, uh, deducing his plans and everything. And he has a little 
he has a little altercation with his this ghost uh, that's contained kind of looks like a yellow slimer <sighs> and apparently the ghost knows how to do this <laughs> but meanwhile uh, Ray Pete and Winston they're back in Paris dealing with this threat and I can't give much away let's just say collateral damage is involved but that's as far as I'm going this was a good issue this was very fun it's not the best written comic book in the world but man I give this a four based on how fun I how much fun I had reading this issue this was great all right end in IDW with Gem and the Holograms number 15 this is part five of Dark Gem um, Thompson and Campbell uh, still doing a good job with this um, yeah I uh, somebody messaged me on Tumblr asking me if I've watched the cartoon yet yeah okay I get it I, I know the or uh, the original cartoon series is on Netflix have I watched it no I haven't watched it yet but I have put it on my list I'll I'll get around to watching it eventually, but as of right now, no, I still not have I still not have watched the cartoon. I I just I just don't feel motivated enough to watch the cartoon because it took it happened all the way back in the early '80s when I was when I was about this tall. So I I, I don't know. I kind of skeptical, but the comic is is good for what it is, for what it is. Uh, Gem and the girls. And I've got their backs against the wall here because uh, their plan in the last issue was to just simply disconnect Synergy and they thought that that would end Silica's, you know, voodoo magic on, on everybody. But unfortunately, Synergy breaks it down to them and says, if you unplug me, it's not really going to do anything to Silica. Silica has now become her own being and she's going to continue to spread her curse even after you unplug me and stuff like that. We also get a really cute flashback into Jem and the girl's childhood. You know, we get to see Jem, uh, Jerrica's mother and father in here. And we get a glimpse as to why Synergy glitched and created Silica. Really good stuff. Meanwhile, the, the Misfits, excuse me, the Holograms find out that there's a couple of members of the Misfits that are affected by this, by the Silica magic and... Uh, an old familiar face comes back to sort out the playing field by devising a team up. This was good stuff. Really good issue. I really enjoyed it. It was fun. It was cute. Um, yeah, I love it. it it's, it's fun. It's nothing more I can say about it. I give it a 3.5. Alright, we're moving on to Joe Books Limited with... Darkwing Duck number two. Holy shit! Uh, Mr. Sp Sparrow, Savani, Dale House, everybody that has been working on this. This was phenomenal. This was fantastic. This is part two of Orange is the New Purple. DW is in a serious heap of trouble. He's, he's trapped in a prison. And he's on the run from literally every criminal he's locked away. Oh my god, we get to see some classic Darkwing Duck villains and some, um, some unsung heroes in the, the rogues gallery for Darkwing Duck. Uh, the stuff with Liquidator was great. The stuff with Muck Duck was good. Uh, the scene with... Uh, when uh, Goslin jumps into the fray, uh, there's a certain certain villain she comes across, and I thought that was just hilarious. You got the little kitten, uh, Karen, I forgot the guy's name, but um, yeah, he goes directly to Negaduck to strike a deal. And meanwhile, all this stuff's going wrong, and Negaduck notices something. And when he does, I'm going, no, for the love of God, don't you dare. 
Oh. Oh, damn. Uh, this has this has been nothing short of incredible. And we're only two issues in. This was fantastic. I mean, props to everybody who worked on this. This is really, really good. I can't wait to read the next issue. This was so good. An easy four out of five. All right, we're moving on to Marvel with The Amazing Spider-Man number 1.5. How many one-point shit is this? This is part five of Amazing Grace. Melina and Bianchi are still working on this story. Um, look, it's more of this whole religious theory and all that stuff. What's going on is that this story is really stretching me with this whole what's your belief, what's your faith, and all that other bullshit. You're bringing religion and religious beliefs into, a, into the comic book and you're narrowing it down to one specific religion. It's going to rub some people and other people's religions completely the wrong way. And I can certainly understand the opinion the opinions of the people who are extremely pissed off at this storyline because of the heavy emphasis on religion I get it I understand it but you know maybe sometimes you gotta think about this as, from a business perspective how do you really get the people's attention how do you really get grab a hold of the consumers and the potential customers and really get their attention by giving them a subject that might not agree with them that might rub them the wrong way it's like man a lot of people are giving this a lot of people are giving this story shit I gotta check it out you know you can look at it that way I look at it as Marvel being ballsy in an area where they shouldn't be ballsy you know what I'm saying but it, it is what it is. It's fine. I don't personally have a problem with it. It's just at the end of the day, this storyline so far is still kind of eh for me. Uh, this particular this particular part, I I wasn't thrilled about it, but I didn't hate it. It just it is what it is. I I'm not gonna go into detail about the shit that's going on in here because quite frankly, I'm not gonna even gonna waste my time. I'll just say I'll give it a three. I'll be nice. Now for a book that's not new. This is kind of old, but I wanted to talk about it anyway. Angela, Queen of Hell, number seven. Marjorie Bennett, thank you for this. This was really good. I'm going to wrap this up real nice and sweet here. Uh, this, this is the finale of the Angela stuff, and it's a shame to see her go. And uh, personally, my favorite part of the book was the love letter to the fans that Marjorie Bennett herself wrote at the end of the book. I thought that was good. Thought that was really good. Uh, Angela and Sarah, hope to see this couple again. Uh, hopefully, maybe in Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, the stuff that they that they go through in here is really good. We get to see their lives in a course of seven years, how they would progress as a couple throughout the course of seven years, and it's very, very well done, very well told. The artwork is good. Still, my biggest problem is still the pop culture references and the fourth wall breaking. You can do shit like that with Deadpool, but I just don't think it fits with a character like Angela. You know, with storytelling like this, with the heavy emphasis on the drama that you're trying to deliver with this story, the fourth wall breaking and the pop culture references really, really hurts it. Uh, but the finale, it was still good nonetheless. I'll give it a 3.5. Let's move on. Daredevil number seven. Solemn Bifagni. Uh, Just. Oh my god. Whose cornflakes did Electra piss in? This was amazing. This was really good. Uh, Electra is going on and on and on with Daredevil about her daughter. She even gives a really good well-told backstory about her daughter and it's like okay you know when you think about it that kind of makes sense it happened at a time where her and Daredevil weren't uh, around each other that much and uh, in the backstory of Elektra's daughter it did kind of make sense to me uh, even though it just 
just came out of nowhere in the last issue and now we're getting more and more into this story and Matt is talking with Foggy about the possibility that this could be his kid and Matt's just going oh my god now one thing I gotta point out is that ever since the Daredevil TV show on Netflix happened now I'm starting to see the artists starting to draw Matt Murdock like the guy from the TV show you don't need to do that find your own unique way Marvel get an artist on, da on Daredevil and just have the artist just go crazy with him just say you know what don't worry about the guy on TV don't forget it. don't worry about the guy on Netflix draw what you think Matt Murdock should look like I mean you don't see you know my old mentor Craig used to say you don't see too many people drawing Wolverine looking like fucking Hugh Jackman so why do we gotta have Matt Murdock looking like the guy on fucking Netflix it's not necessary and again th that's just me I don't want to see Storm drawn like Halle Berry I don't want to see Peter Parker drawn like Andrew Garfield or, or God forbid Tommy McGuire you know it, it's just it is what it is uh, but the then the the big twist of, of revolving around Electra's daughter ooh, I need to stop right now and just say this book was fantastic it easily gets a four Going on to Extraordinary X-Men number 10, Jeff Lemire, Humberto Ramos. This is great shit. I mean, this is the next chapter of the Apocalypse Wars. You know, uh, Storm and her team of X-Men are confronted by the four horse, the new four horsemen of the Apocalypse, and one of them is indeed Colossus. And, you know, Storm's trying to keep her team of X-Men alive, plus keep the 600 potential new mutant embryos alive. And everything. Uh, there's a really big moment in here for Jean. Uh, I, I love all these characters. These all these characters are really growing on me. Iceman has a great moment in here. Um, I usually kind of go meh at big motivational speech cliches, but something about Iceman's in here was really good because uh, it was kind of more of a like an ironic kind of speech and I thought it hammered on and I thought it really nailed the character development of Bobby it was just really good but then that cliffhanger fuck me oh oh my god great issue another four Jesus Christ what are you doing to me Marvel the Mighty Thor, number seven. Uh, Jason Aaron did a good job with this, and the artists, the art, um, the artwork. I didn't really care for it. It just looked really, really sloppy, and it looked kind of. Ugh. I I know you're wanting to tell a story that's gritty and from the past, but the artwork in here, I just didn't like it. I'm sorry. Artwork was just horrible. Uh, but <laughs> LOL, Thor wins at the end. I'm, I'm a very predictable finish to the story. It, it's like Thor doesn't get his second win until he gets him some some mead and some women, and it just kind of it just was kind of reminiscent of Popeye eating a can of fucking spinach. And it's like, okay, Thor's had his spinach. Now it's time to kick some ass. And, and there you go. And that's pretty much what this was. And that's pretty much what this issue and this whole story line was. This was really not nothing special for me. I didn't really, really didn't care too much for it. The, the artwork was horrendous and the writing was good. But at the end it was just, eh, I give it a three. Spider-Man Deadpool number five. Joe Kelly and Ed McGinnis still doing a great job with this. No bullshit. Deadpool put a slug right in Parker's forehead in the last issue. And, yeah, Peter's dead, folks. I mean, it, But his spirit is still available to be saved, and Deadpool finds a way to go in and help him out. So, yeah, he does literally save Peter's life in this issue. But then I noticed a few things in here. Um... One thing that just glared at me, and it triggered my nearly decade-long hatred 
of a certain storyline involving Spider-Man, <clears throat> some particular punk-ass motherfucker shows up in this issue, and I immediately thought to myself, are you fucking kidding me? You're seriously going there, Marvel. Fuck you! But then I looked at the rest of the issue and I thought it's still good for what it is. It's just when that punk ass motherfucker shows up in this issue, it really made my blood boil because it reminded me of something that happened nearly a decade ago and I'm still not fucking over it. Um, but yeah. Nonetheless, it was still a solid book, but he had to show up, and it dragged the book down for me, so I give it a 3.5. Yeah, I fucking went there. Star Wars, number 19. Jason Aaron on L.U., great shit. Really great shit. We finally learned the identity of the culprit who's responsible for fucking with Leia with Leia in this prison and it's a character that I completely forgot about and I'm a big Star Wars nerd and I was like when when he yeah it's a he when he unmasked I went holy shit I just saw his character not too long ago and I can't believe I forgot about it because I thought the fucker was dead uh, and apparently nobody stays dead in a Marvel comic apparently but okay uh, Nicely done. A uh, good wrap up. Uh, nice little ending scene with Leia. It's like uh, <laughs> it's kind of like one of those scenes where it's like, oh, I told you, I I told you, I'd help you. I didn't say nothing about her. You know, <laughs> this is one of those moments. I thought that was really cool. This was a fun issue. It was good. Nice twists. Good artwork. Great storytelling. The force is strong with this one. Yes, I just fucking said that. Good stuff. It gets a four. We're moving on to DC, folks. Batgirl number 52. I don't know why. I just love this cover. This new 52 variant cover. This, you know, take on the Adam Hughes cover from issue number one. But, uh, yeah, I love the cover. But the book inside, I was kind of underwhelmed with the whole conclusion to this storyline to the conclusion of this particular volume of Batgirl. A volume that was started off by Gail Simone. Think about that. Gail Simone started this particular volume of Batgirl and it ends on a meh for me. It wrapped up things nicely and then Barbara just says goodbye to all the supporting cast and then just leaves stating that one day she'll be back and that's it. The book's over. And I'm like, okay, that was kind of underwhelming and kind of disappointing. I'm not going to say it was anticlimactic because it did wrap things up nicely. Um, but nonetheless, I wanted a little more from this. Maybe I maybe I just got spoiled by Gail Simone so much that I just wanted more after she left. But I guess I, guess I was asking for too much. Um, it's not a horrible issue. But in my opinion, this cover is the best part about it. <laughs> so I'll be I'll be generous and give it a three. Moving on to Bombshells number 13. Marjorie Bennett, fantastic stuff. We're bringing in Lois Lane, folks, and she's a kid in here, I believe. I think she's like a teenager or something in here. But this is a story about nobody else but the Bat Girls. And man, this was good. Classic political, uh, classical, cla bleh, 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 bleh. hang on, let me take some of my happy juice. Dr. Pepper. Now let me try that again. Classic political bullshit storytelling that I like. It's just really good. We're also bringing in the Penguin and Killer Frost in here. And to see their bombshell looks, I thought they looked great. Just really good stuff. We find out why, you know, the Batgirls have been labeled as menaces to society and everything like that. And I thought it was wrapped up really well. 
good stuff. I really had fun reading this issue. It was really fun. Uh, it gets a 3.5. Moving on to Cyborg number 11. Marf, Marf fucking Wolfman. Man, he can write this character. Uh, Wolfman does a great job at showing us that Cyborg doesn't really need to, you know, use his weapons and have badass fighting action to be a hero. He does all of his heroics from right up here. And it's really, really well written, really well told. Good stuff. It's also a really good... Uh, it's a cliched lesson, but it's still a lesson I still think needs to be taught from, uh, from time to time. You don't need to profile certain people just based on looking at them. You really shouldn't live your life by just looking at someone and automatically dropping the assumption that they're wicked, they're evil. And that plays a big role in this story. This is really good. Solid read. I enjoyed it. It's a four. Pick of the week, folks. DC Universe Rebirth number one. Everybody that worked on this, great job. I'm not going to say a damn thing other than thank you for this book. This was incredible. Damn. 4.5. Read that book. The Flash, number 52. Jensen Marino, good stuff. Wraps up the story with, uh, you know, with The Flash dealing with the Riddler. I thought it was pretty damn clever. And unfortunately, we had to see the, the debut of the new 52 Wally West's you know, flashlight powers, the true official beginning in the series finale of this particular volume. Uh, hopefully, the New 52 Wally West can do a good job once the rebirth truly starts getting going. Uh, but the way they dealt with the Riddler, thought it was very well handled. Kind of, kind of reeked of a little bit of plot convenience, I'll admit it, that's how I honestly felt at times. But it was still good nonetheless, I did enjoy it, it was great. And I liked the loophole that they used in the storytelling to protect Barry Allen's identity as the Flash. Really good stuff. Uh, an easy four. Moving on to Lois and Clark, number eight. Dan Jurgens. Oh my God. Lee Weeks. Oh my God. This is good. This is a. This was a very very good. Uh, conclusion to this series, to this story. It was really, really well told. You know, little John is still coming to grips, you know, with who his dad was and who his dad still is. Uh, it's slowly planting the seeds for what's to come for Superman and his family in the rebirth stuff. I thought it was handled very well in that lab the, the ending of the story I thought was was cute it was it, it, it was the beginning of what's to come in the future fantastic really really well done another four we're ending this with another ending folks secret six number 14 Gail Simone thank you Gail for for this title Secret Six, I feel like, does not get enough love. Now, I'm not talking about by the fans. The fans give this series a lot of love. But I think it's DC Comics and DC Entertainment themselves that don't give it the love it, that, it des that it deserves. That it's earned. This is really good. Very, very well done. And what I liked about this is that it doesn't end on a 100% happy ending. Does everybody have a happy ending at the end of the issue? No, they don't. But I'm not going to ruin, I'm not going to spoil who has the happy endings and who doesn't have the happy endings. Just leave it up to your imagination. But it was so good to see this team working so well together if it was just 
one more time. Gail, thank you. I love you, girl. This is great stuff. It ended real nicely. Now, to be perfectly honest and fair, this still does not measure up to the last series finale that, get, that Secret Six had. But this was still a great read nonetheless, and I loved it. I will truly miss this title until DC decides, if they ever do decide, to resurface it and try again. And if they do, you need to have Gale on it. This, this title and these characters have been so good over the years, I honestly feel that nobody else, nobody else has earned the right to write a Secret Six comic other than Gail Simone. If it's a Secret Six title, she has to be the one to write it. Don't get anybody else on it. It's her baby. Let it remain her baby. I loved it. Another four. Well, that's all I got for this, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please subscribe to this channel. Don't forget Blue Goblin X and Arkham Asylum Studio. Give some shout out. Give me shout outs as always to my bros, the Mount Vernon Kid, Deadpool Zilla, and Brandon Hex. Follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Facebook, or here. Stick with me here on YouTube. You all know what I say at the end of these fucking videos. Alrighty. Well, guess that's about it. Time for me to stretch out a little bit, finish my Dr. Pepper, and go read some more books. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I am Groot. I'll see y'all later.